Part of the Middletown Health Department, and this is Healthline. Gambling problems can happen to anyone from any walk of life. Gambling goes from a fun, harmless diversion to an unhealthy obsession with serious consequences. So how do you know if you or your loved one has a gambling problem? Diana Good explains how a gambling addiction can impact a relationship, interfere with work, and lead to financial hardship. Welcome to Healthline. Our guest today is Diana Good. Ms. Good is the Executive Director of the Connecticut Council on Problem Gambling. Diana, thank you for being here. Thank you. And a timely discussion as uh, gambling is just increasing across the United States in various forms. And what has that meant to your agency? First of all, let's talk about your agency and what you do, and then we're going to ask some questions about how individuals are in, impacted. Thank you. Um, so I can tell you what we are not. Uh, the Connecticut Council on Problem Gambling is not for or against gambling. Um, we just want to make sure that there are safeguards in place when people do have a gambling problem and they run into trouble. We are not the fun police. We are not here to tell people how to spend their disposable income. We just want to make sure that if someone does have a problem with gambling, if it is no longer fun, there's a place to call, and that is us. And so it's more responsible gambling. Absolutely. Now, given that and the state of gambling in Connecticut and across the United States, what have you seen as a trend as the different types of gambling has increased? Casinos are becoming more prevalent in this region. How has that Maybe the word is not impacted, but how's that? Uh, I'm going to use that impacted your agency. It has impacted our agency. We definitely have seen an increase in people calling our helpline. One of the big issues right now is gambling is just becoming so much easier. It used to be in order to gamble, you had to get up, you had to put clothes on, you had to go outside, whether it's to go to a casino um, or go to get a lottery ticket. What we're looking at now is that a lot of people are going to be able to gamble on their phone, so they don't have to get up and go out and do anything. So we think that that's really going to increase the prevalence of problem gambling. And is there any type of individual, for lack of a better word, that is more susceptible to becoming a problem gambler given the easiness of it now? You know, that's really the hard part is you don't know who the problem gamblers are. With a lot of other addictions, addictions like drugs and alcohol, you can sometimes tell who that person is. You can spot the alcoholic. You can spot the person who's doing drugs. Unfortunately, with gambling, you cannot spot that. And I fell into that trap almost on my first week at this job about a year and a half ago. I was at a conference in Massachusetts, and I was sitting next to this totally put together woman, great haircut, great suit, the whole thing. And I kept asking her questions, thinking that she was a therapist. And then we went into a breakout session and the person who was doing the breakout said, raise your hand if you're a problem gambler. And she raised her hand. And I'm thinking this whole time, I'm thinking she's a therapist and she's here because she's a problem gambler. So you really can't tell who's got the addiction and who doesn't. Go ahead. The, the other thing that really makes it a problem is you also don't know what's going to happen. You might win, you're probably going to lose, the odds are you're going to lose, whereas if you're, drug, if you're doing drugs or alcohol, you drink a 30-pack of beer, you pretty much know what's going to happen. With gambling, you're not sure what's going to happen, and that's what makes it even more addictive. So how do people become problem gamblers? What are, if there's no real signs, are there symptoms? Um. Not really. That's also the problem. Um, some of the things that you look out for is a preoccupation with gambling, um, lying about gambling. Um, the other issue is a lot of times people don't raise their hand to say there's a problem until everything's gone because it, they don't see it as losing. They're going to just win that money back. And when you say lying about gambling, what do you mean lying to whom, yourself or others? Both, or both? yeah, uh, but definitely to other people. Uh, about how much time you're spending gambling, about how much money you're spending gambling. You, know, you hear about big lottery winners. You don't hear how much it, they spent trying to get those winning tickets. So that's another issue for problem gambling, for sure. And, and so what can somebody new, do if they feel like they're out of control? And I guess maybe that's the operative phrase is out of control. 
what what typically could or should happen? We have a helpline number that you can call, text, or chat 24 hours a day. The number is 888-789-7777. During the day when you call, you connect to someone on our staff who has been a therapist. So she knows all of the therapists around the state that can help, and she can often get someone into treatment that day. So we work with what's called Better Choice Clinics, which specialize in gambling. We also suggest people call Gammonon or Gamblers Anonymous um, because you're not alone. That's another thing that people think with this addiction is they think that they're weak. They're the only ones who have this problem and they're not. They are not alone. Are we seeing with the advent of video games for kids, uh, are we seeing younger people being involved in gambling? I mean, I've heard of things of uh, uh, kids in high school, middle school, actually doing the uh, football wagering and, and, and pools, things like that. Is is that occurring? And if so, how prevalent is that? Very prevalent. Uh, we used to think of problem gamblers as the little old ladies at the casinos playing the slot machines. Now, it really is men in their 20s. Uh, they grew up on fantasy football. They grew up playing video games, and it just has evolved into problem gambling. And buried within a lot of video games is something called a loot box, where you're buying to get ahead in the game. You're buying for certain pieces of the game, um, not really realizing that that is gambling. Often you spin the wheel for luck and can win something that will help you along in the game. Um, that's conditioning people's brains for problem gambling. And that really is an issue. The younger and younger people are, the more of an addiction that becomes. Do you think it's more accepted too? As let's, let's go back 20 years. Do you think it's more accepted by society in general? Well, it's just, you know, it's harmless and more gambling. Sure, why not? We need the revenue. Right. Definitely a way to look at it. And it's definitely very harmful. Um, it has become really a norm in our society. Um, and again, that's fine. If this is something that people do and that's the way they want to spend their income, that's fine. But when it becomes not fun, we just want to make sure that people know that they can call. You're listening to Healthline. Our guest today is uh, Diana Good from the Connecticut Council on Problem Gambling. And we are talking, in fact, about problem gambling. And once again, we are emphasizing that your agency is not against gambling. It's a resource to help somebody who is in trouble. What about the people besides the ones who are in trouble? How does it impact their family, their friends, their relationships? What kinds of things have you seen? There's a huge impact. A lot of times when someone finally raises their hand and says there's a problem gambler, They've drained their 401k, they've stopped paying the mortgage and maybe foreclosed on, they've spent their kid's college fund. So it has a huge impact on the family with really negative consequences where often the family doesn't want to help out. So in a lot of cases with drugs and alcohol, when someone raises their hand and says they need help, the family's really psyched about that, really psyched about the fact that they want to get help. In a number of cases with problem gamblers, your family's really upset and really pissed off at you because you've gone through all of the savings. Um, we had one woman in Massachusetts who said she couldn't even get $10 to get an Uber to go to a GA meeting because her family just assumed they were going to use it for gambling. Um, so the impact on the family is really devastating. And how about um, people that have done so, have become problem gamblers and... Their, their impact on their work, their employment, there, there must have been issues there, too. Absolutely. A lot of people are in jail because of problem gambling, um, embezzling, stealing from coworkers. Absolutely. One of the things that we're also working on um, is trying to bring a diversion court to Connecticut. Um, instead of having people go straight to jail because of these crimes, let's get them help, just like drugs and alcohol, viewing it as a sickness. And instead of putting them in jail, making sure they get treatment. Because often people go into jail and they just keep gambling. Because that's something you can do in jail, and you can gamble on anything. Um, one of the people at CCPG does a lot within the pr prison system, and the stories she can tell are crazy. They're betting for cheeseburgers on which cockroach is going to make it to the end of the room first. Um, so it is not in people's best interest to send problem gamblers to jail in a lot of cases, which is why we'd like to bring a diversion court to Connecticut. So it really is more of an addiction um, than than anything else. And as so, do you see like other addictions, people who have gone through programs 
what's the success rate on that? Is is it very high or is it does it meet with moderate success? Moderate success. That's why we work with so many different agencies. We work with the Better Choice Program, which um, does a lot of work in Connecticut. We also work with GA and Gamblers Anonymous because there is no one size fits all. So we want to make sure that we can treat the individual and get them the help that they need. And, and back to the question that we talked about earlier about the expansion of gambling. We're seeing that, as I said, not only in this area, but throughout the nation. Do you think that it's, well, again, not taking a position, but are you more likely to see people who have gambling problems because now there's other avenues? Maybe they weren't um, addicted to the lottery, but now there's uh, online betting and there's the option of doing something else. Do you think that's going to increase the number of of people with problems? Absolutely. One of the statistics that we use, if you live within 40 miles of a casino, the odds are much better that you're going to become a problem gambler. Uh, With the addition of a new casino in Connecticut, everyone is going to live within 40 miles of a casino. So, We're also working on a regional self-exclusion. Um, so the casinos both have a self-exclusion policy where if you say you don't want to go to the casino anymore, there's a form that you fill out, and it is trespassing if you do show up at the casino after filling out that form. But with MGM right around the corner, Boston now has a new casino. Rhode Island's got casinos. New York, very prevalent. We want to have a regional self-exclusion form. So if you fill out that form at one of the casinos, you're banned from all of the casinos in the region. So currently it's for the only the uh, casino that you filled the form out. Correct. And you have to go to the casino to fill it out which is kind of counterintuitive. (laughs) So we'd also like to have um, hot spots around the region and around our state so people can come and fill out that form without going to the casino. And again, it would also mean that, okay, you can't go into a casino, but again, there's other avenues of gambling. Do you think people who actually maybe abide by that and don't go back to the casino, do you think they really seek other forms of gambling too or... Is it, I'm just going to stop entirely? Really depends on the person. Really depends on the motivation. Um, It certainly has worked for a lot of people. It has certainly failed for a lot of people as well. Um, And there is no lottery self-exclusion. So we'd like to get that in place too, especially if you can start using credit cards and buy lottery tickets on your phone. And that's that's not uh, legal currently, but that is being proposed? Correct. And and what is your advice, and I don't want to say warning, but what is your advice for legislators? Uh, it, without being political, what would you tell a legislator if they were sitting here, <laughs> if he or she were sitting here right now, what would you say to them about gambling, problem gambling? Certainly, we would like dedicated funds set aside if gambling increases. This is not old money. We're not asking for funds to be redirected to problem gambling. We're just asking that as you are making more money on gambling, that part of that is goes to problem gambling services. Um, We're also looking at proposing one solid minimum age for gambling. Right now at 18, you can buy lottery tickets, can't go to a casino until you're 21. We would like one consistent age. We would also really like a gaming commission like they have in Massachusetts. Right now, consumer protection is overseeing gambling, and we just don't think that that's solid enough with everything else they have to do. And what about regional cooperation with other states that have gambling, such as New Jersey, Massachusetts, New York? Uh, Any recommendations as far as that goes? Well, we're looking at the regional voluntary self-exclusion form. Um, And outside of that, most states are going to stay within their regions because everyone's got to have different laws in place, different regulations in place. Um, And each state wants to make sure that they are getting the money from people betting in their state. Um, So as far as that's concerned, it's going to stay very segmented state by state. And again, it's so important. Let's give out that number. And if you have a website, let's do that too. Absolutely. The phone number is 888-789-7777. And our website is ccpg.org. Diana Good, thank you for being our guest today on Healthline. Healthline is produced by the Community Health Education Section of the Middletown Health Department, which is solely responsible for its content. Please join us again next month at this time for another edition of Healthline.